Let me first introduce you, Jared yes. Casey. And you teach at the University College Dublin. University College Dublin. University College Dublin. And uh, your profession is? Philosophy. Yes. Okay. And you have a new book out on Rothbard. I do indeed. Let's just jump right into that. Murray That's what Rothbard, everybody cares yeah. about right now. I mean, we love you, but let's hear about your <laughs> you book. You want to hear the book? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what can I say? I wish you were called the worldview of Rothbard as per the advertisement in the uh, uh, in the AC, ASC guide. But actually, it's just called Murray Rothbard because the series is part of uh, is called the major conservative and libertarian thinkers. So there are twenty volumes, and so just have the names of the people: Locke, Hume, okay, von Mises, Rothbard, and uh-huh. so it's in there. So it's one of those. I see. So do they give you a word limit? Uh, yes. Yeah, and yeah, did and, you have and, an outline? And, and they, they, yeah, they want they, they uh-huh. want a kind of intellectual bio. Then they want a substantive chapter which deals with the with thought critically. I see. They want a what's it, contemporary relevance, uh-huh. and then uh, current. Sort of fair, so. so we've got we've got uh, you know, Strauss, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, whatever Rothbard, yeah, yeah, right? As yeah. one of the vi- well, it's important to get him in there, right? Right. So he, it wasn't the it wasn't the given that he was going to be in there. Or did you have to lobby for well, this? No, uh, but they 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 were the the general editor is a guy called John Medicroft from University College London. He's a good guy, uh, and um, you know it could have been somebody else, and so he was in touch with me about something else, and and. And you told him to look at you. I'm a fan of. Well, I think he was looking for somebody. He knew he wanted to know if I knew somebody who could do it. And I said, I'll I'll do it. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Me. Yeah. And uh, so I did. Yeah. Uh, Um, And did you take the approach of introducing the whole of Rothbard's thought? I mean, how could anybody do that? You you can't. So you have to be really selective. So the first is basically life and times from an intellectual perspective. So it's reasonably short. The second one kind of looks to some extent at the praxeology side. So it kind of goes light on the economics. I'm not doing man economy in the state. Uh, So it's called like Rothbard the Libertarian. So I focus on that. And then the, the, the third one is really on Rothbard the Historian, which not even, which even people who know a lot about Rothbard don't know, you know, they won't have read the four volumes on, on American history or they won't have read the two volume economic history. And uh, I find Rothbard very interesting as an historian. Right. A historian okay. and historian of thought. A historian right? of thought. Yeah, right. exactly. Right. So the third chapter, I think, even for people who are aficionados and, and so on, might find something of interest in there, especially because I reviewed the um, review literature. In other words, the reviews that came out in the journals. I see. Of like, as as like um, find them. Panic of 1819. And yeah, like, from the very, and, early, from the very yeah, earliest work right. up to the latest Conceived stuff. of liberty and everything. So I put all that in. And the last one then really just takes all of that and applies it to current circumstances. And I kind of, that's where I kind of let myself go a little bit and had so a bit of fun. If, if, if Rothbard had not been an economist, had not been a philosopher, uh, he could have been a historian, right? I mean, oh, yeah, clearly. Yeah, yeah. Clearly. And in, in, the, in the course of the chapter, I say that one of the reasons why he didn't go down particularly well with the historian establishment was because his, his approach is so different and, and so on. He does really call a lot of things into question that to, they, to they history. take for granted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he adopts the same radical uh, perspective. And, of course, he brings his libertarianism to bear. I mean, what he's focusing on, what he's looking for, for evidence of uh, is... Uh, 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 stress on liberty and on freedom. Well, sure. It's the same way as uh, you and I, when we pick up the newspaper, we go, oh, well, look, uh, you know, Qaddafi's killing his own people. That's what states <laughs> do or whatever. You know, you have this libertarian. Pre- so Murray looked back at uh, history and did the same thing, yeah. right? Yeah. There's an intimacy he had with history, I, I find. Uh, but he also has, I think he has a narrative style in it that many historians would or should die for. It's just like I don't think the man was in, was capable of writing a dull word. You might disagree with him. You might think he goes over right. the top, but the one cardinal sin he does never commits is being dull or boring. Well, he's he's excited to tell you about what he knows. He's he's an evangelical. He's he's got news to tell and he's <laughs> bursting to tell you. Yeah, he can't okay? wait. To, and and he's he never a, he's the kind of guy. You know, if you met him in the corridor. You wouldn't escape. It'd be 45 <laughs> minutes and you'd be saying, I've got to go to an appointment and so on. And he'd be still telling. And you'd still be interested. Yeah, okay. until about 4 a.m. as 4 I recall. As I, yeah, per- <laughs> I never knew him personally. And that's one, my, my one regret I'd love to have known yeah. him. Okay. Now, you had um, f- finished all your academic studies and, and got your present teaching position and everything. And then you bumped into 
Rothbard and the Austrian tradition. Yeah, yeah. It was, oh, um, I'm a very late convert and so on. Uh, um, so I was well, uh, I came as a real shock to me. I was always interested in uh, the phenomenon of money and uh, what it was. It seemed a very mysterious sort of thing. Obviously, you could show pieces of paper or coins and so on, but it seemed a very odd sort of thing that people were willing to <laughs> exchange goods and services for crumpled, dirty pieces of paper. So uh, a friend of mine who was interested in German uh, philosophy was on a sabbatical, and he brought me home a copy of uh, Mises' Theory of Money and Credit. I see. Which is like, wow. Yeah, it explains it. everything. And yeah, okay, and it does. And it does it in such a way, I mean, again, Mises doesn't see, have the same kind of touch as Rothbard does in terms of being sort of popular and appealing on the, on the surface and so on. But because I was, I was turned on to this particular question, for me, it was like the answer is, and 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 then not only not only persuasive in the sense that yes it may well be true but there are others but persuasive in the sense that it kind of wrestled me to the ground oh. cut me in a half Nelson and I couldn't move. But it's so systematic. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's super. Yeah. Uh, but uh, as I said before, it's not where you normally start. It's right. not you know in that sense. But it, you, know, you need you need to start where your interests are, and those were mine. And she, she, I was I mean sure as people have told you the same story. Once you start, you're on the slippery slope, is it where you go, and, you know. And yet it's a credit to you. Action, yeah. I mean, it's a credit to you that you were, um, you had a teachable spirit, even as a, you know. Mature. A, a mature <laughs> uh, academic. Uh, yeah. That's well, a little unusual. I don't know, but, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, my kids often wonder what I'm going to do when I grow up, and I think <laughs> this, I feel the same way. You know, it's, it's yeah, I just, um I'm not. I'm not like the Athenians, always on the lookout for something new necessarily. But, but I do have questions, and uh, th- th- those are the kind of things which were motivating me. And it just happened that at the right time, when these questions were live, to use the kind of Jamesian sense for me, the book came, and poof, the result was you know putting a detonator in some jelly night. And now, do you feel the uh, Rothbard has been? You read a lot of reviews of his book, and you yeah. see that he's v- variously criticized yep. from the left, from the right, from yep. uh, from all. Do do you feel the the need to come to his defense? I think you have in several papers. Yes, I have. Um, look, nobody's perfect, right? And that includes Rothbard. So uh, nobody gets everything right all the time. Um, but the one thing. And you could you could make uh, accusations of various kinds. Uh, you know, people have accused him of perhaps not being as scholarly at times as he needed to be, and that may well be right. Okay, uh, but in a sense, he was producing so much material, and and I'm very happy to forgive him because of the liveliness of what he's got, and somebody else can fill in the details and cross the t's and dot the i's and so on. But the one thing you can't criticize him for is raw intellectual integrity, and that comes to me shining through the page. I mean, he's the, he's, the, he's, he's the guy who could be completely wrong. I'm not saying he is, but he could be completely wrong on something. But he, would, he clearly believes and is passionately interested in what he's talking about and is not, and, and is not uh, afraid to change his mind if he needs to do it and so on. But, but he always comes across. He has, the, um, he has the sort of passion of a very good teacher. This is what you always look for in a teacher, is somebody who not only knows the stuff but is really passionately interested in it and managed to communicate that. It's like lighting a torch. It's like lighting a fire and passing it on to the students. And he does that. And in his, in his writings all the time, you, however, I mean, people have you know, remarked and it was contrary and he was you know, hard to get along with or, and so on. I, I, that may be so. I didn't know him, but I, I, I can tell you, if I'd known him, we wouldn't have had any problem getting along. <laughs> okay? He's just my kind of guy, if only because of that absolutely outrageous cackle that he had, which I've heard on the recordings. I mean, anybody who laughs like that is my kind of guy. <laughs> so, so, you know, so I would, I would have killed to be the kind of guy who was stuck in his apartment in New York until four o'clock in the morning. I would have been there until six. He would have, he would have had to throw me out. Yeah. That's how it would have part worked. Of the, part of the revolutionary band of five people or yeah, whatever that would be, it was. Yeah, yeah. We, I, would, I would have been there. Okay, I'd have signed up. But so that, that really comes across. And you know, I'm, not, I'm not saying other people don't have intellectual incre- integrity, but he, he has it. And he has it in a way in which, and he lives it out. He lives it out in his writings. He lives it out in his polemical work. He lives it out in, in the, in the, in the engagement engagements that he, he had, practical engagements, what he did and what he didn't do. And yeah, okay, so he, he might be a little bit prickly and all of the rest, but hey, so am I. I mean, you, human beings are like that. Uh, right. I much prefer him like that. Right. With, with a few rough edges and, right. and so on, rather than me all smooth and polished and on How did you, uh, how did, in your book, how do you assess his, well, let me ask it this way. I was going to ask about his anarchism, but let me just ask it uh, more broadly. Uh, what do you think Rothbard's major contributions to the world of ideas really are. I mean, if you're going to name 
two, three, or four, what would they be? Okay, I'm not going to comment on the economic stuff because I'm not really okay. that confident. So I'm going to. Okay. So my, my my not mentioning doesn't mean that those aren't important. I think they are probably. But economists had better comment on that. I think his major contribution is his well, probably twofold. One, his taking the idea of liberty really seriously. And he has the virtues of a logician. I'm a logician myself by training, and I recognize it. So that he takes the idea, and he's prepared to follow it wherever it takes him. He's not saying, oh, this would be unpopular, or this would might be inexpedient, or this might upset somebody. I might not get promoted. Yeah. Or, or, <laughs> well, he didn't, right? <laughs> but, but he didn't seem to worry, right? So he, take, he has that, and I love that. I mean, OK, even if the guy is completely wrong, at least you're consider- and you're working all it, but I don't think he is. But he takes that, okay. And the other really interesting thing for me, from the point of view, because this appeals to me as a Catholic to some extent, Catholics often tend to think that sort of uh, uh, the attra- natural law is something which is sort of Catholic doctrine or something, and it isn't, of course, right? But nonetheless, it it has received it's probably its greatest development, and most of its adherents would be in the Catholic tradition. Rothbard's not in that tradition, and yet he discovers that himself, and it has an immediate appeal to him. So he manages to combine the, his libertarian views and he gives it a grounding in natural law, which I think is probably the only way it can be grounded. Okay, I, I know there's, okay, I know there are people who do it u- through a utilitarian perspective, uh, people like David Friedman and others. Um, but apart from the fact that whenever, if you ever do that, you're always giving hostages to fortune because it's always open to somebody to come up and say, well, if we go down the liberty route, it's not actually going to be productive of the greatest good for the greatest number or whatever it might be. Uh, and that's something you'd have to take into account. But I think in the end, it's not principled. And Rothbard's account is principled. So he tries, uh, in the, especially in the Ethics of Liberty, right. which, I, which I use as a textbook, actually, for a course I'm doing. Yeah, And the students find it incredibly exciting. Yes. But it's uh, just one chapter on, or two on natural law. Oh, he throws it away. Yeah. It's, it's almost yeah. like he's, he's saying, well, I'm doing this because it's kind of obvious and so on. So I take a bit longer to do it. But he does. He just kind of throws it away. But he, he exhibits it. He instantiates it in the rest of the book. Yes. Okay. So you, you get this... You get this um, uh, grounding in natural law in a fully Thomas tradition, uh, and then uh, a quick movement into a kind of, a, a kind of an, an enlightenment style uh, embrace of uh, human rights, and then a little further down yeah. the trajectory, you're, you end in anarchism. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, this, these are uh, this is a gigantic. Sort well, of, it's a uh, little apparatus. book with a with a with a, an almighty charge. Well, okay, I mean, it's the kind of book that. Probably should probably take about a thousand pages. Uh, sure, to but do it. but but Murray spelled it out quickly so you can get it. That's what I'm saying. And then you fill it in. But the great right. thing from a pedagogical point of view is because it's relatively short, because the chapters are brief, because he writes so well and engagingly. Even if there are questions that are not answered and 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 roughnesses and so on, it's precisely the right kind of text to give to an undergraduate right. with an inquiring mind because there are lots of things you can latch onto. And not only does he, not only does, like, it's not a stuffy piece of philosophical work, all polished and, you know, so nobody can engage with it. And you have the application chapters. And there are things in there that I just find slightly outrageous myself, but that's fine. It's great. It's challenging. It's engaging. Um, it's annoying. Well, it's wonderful. I it's think all you, of these you make a good point about his applications in this, and I'm not sure I've entirely thought about it this way, but sometimes people say, well, Rothbard had his conclusion in mind and then uh, sort of... Uh, uh, patched up his argument to to arrive at it, but but you're saying really the opposite. He had a an argument in mind and wanted to see what where, the it, conclu- would where it would go. Yeah, look, I mean, <clears throat> let's be frank. If you were, if I were to take a minimal government position, I would have many more converts. I would have many more people who'd be prepared to buy it. If I said, look, let's take off all the stuff about uh, communications and we don't need the government. Let's take off health, education and welfare. It might be more difficult, but let's get rid of all that. And let's just say we need the government for provision of law and order, legal services and so on. uh, And so we're we're stuck with that. And they'd probably go, yeah, it's that last one. That's the real sticking point. Okay, so when I'm doing my class, I I tell the students how it works and I go and, and I'm going all the way. I'm not stopping here. I'm going all the way. I mean, this is the this is the this is the pons asinorum. This is the one, you know, that really tests whether you want to take it all the way. Right. That's the hard. And if you you recall how um, power and market opens, right? The first chapter, boom, national defense. Yeah. So you get that one yeah. at least yeah. in Rothbard's yeah. mind. That's the first one, and and of course, 
I mean, even to the publishers, this was something like oh, that, yeah, a it's scandal. Oh, yeah, it's a nervous breakdown. Yeah. I mean, you know, so they, they subverted it basically. And, and, and yet you look around the world today. I mean, what is the power that the state has that's the most potentially deadly? Yes, absolutely. So Roth, I mean, right. as you, if you, I mean, if you do the numbers, I mean, how many people have been killed in the 20th century? And I say to, I say to my first year class, I was saying the other day, this is not in the libertarian class, but saying, uh, count up the number of people who've been killed by the state or those who aspire to control the state. Okay, put that in one column. And I said, on the other column, put the number of people who've been killed by ordinary decent murders. Okay, by in revenge or in crime. And Duel. Okay, start, start, start from the ground and you come up to here with this one and you're barely half an inch off the ground on the other one. Ooh, and what was the function of the state again? To preserve the peace and order and to protect us and so on. Hmm, I wonder, we might have a slight problem here, don't you think? <laughs> now, did you uh, find that you had reflected on the nature of the state um, uh, before you had read Rothbard, uh, or was this was not this a, a, really? Yeah. I would have probably t accepted it as a, an un, a sort of an unpleasant necessity. Uh, I was doing a job that somebody had to do. Not that I particularly wanted to do it, but yeah, I wouldn't really have thought about it. Political philosophy wasn't something I was particularly interested. So, in. but but Murray identifies the state, right? I mean, he says this is the state, and he puts a circle around it. He investigates it closely and helps the reader understand it as something special, unique, uh, pervasive, more so than you thought, and, and unclouds the mind. He does, yeah. The, uh, well, the other thing, I mean, since since I started on down this road, I mean, I've been investigating the historical antecedents. I've been reading a lot of stuff. There's a huge amount of material on there. And the one very interesting thing is that it wouldn't be true to say that the state is a 17th century invention, but the state as we know it is a 17th century invention. In other words, the, 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 the more or less the essential components of the state have been present in all uh, coercive governments in empires and so on. But the particular kind of state that we now have, which we gener which most people simply take for granted, the first thing I have to do in my class is to impress upon the students the contingency, the sheer raw contingency of the state. The nation state as we know it. Yeah, I just say, look, there was a time when it did not exist. There will be a time please God, soon, okay, when it will not exist. And people will look back and talk about the age of the state. Okay. And, but for us, the, the, the nature of, of, of human beings is that we tend, when we look around the world, we tend to see not only that things are so, but without reflecting on it too much, we conclude from this that they must be so. It must be this way. So, uh, and I give, I give hackneyed examples. I say, when I was growing up in Ireland, telephones were provided by the Department of Post and Telegraphs. You know, you had to apply for one. It took two years in order to get one. Uh, you had no control over the color of the apparatus. They put it wherever they wanted to, usually in a drafty hall, and they charged you whatever you like. Okay? But, but this was the natural order. Yeah. This was the way it was and the way it had to be. To move forward 50 or 60 years, and and now there are rival phone companies, and you can have a telephone on the top of your roof if you want, and you can have a Mickey Mouse one dangling from your ceiling, and you can, you know, you can have different services. Or, and none, so, none, or at none at all. Or none at all. And just use so, one of these. So it's quite, right. it's, yeah, I mean, so you see, again, and so I try to use examples like these to, to shift, to, to unsettle. The, the idea that things must be so. And once and, and so, for example, in terms of the anarchy thing, instead of coming straight at the state, I use examples that I've got from the BBC recordings of programs where they talk about the removal of traffic lights. Oh, of course. And, and yeah. so they just, so that, that's not contentious, okay? That doesn't raise any questions yeah. about, or, about, about uh, force or crime and so on where, where people are involved. But you, just, you, you can actually see graphically what happens when you actually remove the traffic lights. It's better. And then you realize, yeah. and the guy tells you, there are 48,000 sets of traffic lights in the UK. And then they show, and then you see the photographs, and there's a whole bunch of people sitting at traffic lights, spew, fumes spewing out, and, and on the other side, and nobody's moving. They're all just sitting there, and nobody's moving. And then you see a village where they took, deliberately took out the traffic lights, and one woman predicted chaos. She said, this place is mad enough. You take out the traffic lights, it's going to be 10 times worse. She came back to her three days later, and she said, I can't believe it. Looked around the camera, there's nobody there. There's a car, an occasional car whizzing by. <laughs> it's just, you know. And so that, those are the kinds of things, you know, and of course, uh, you know, Rothbard would have approved of these, because these are the kinds of things that, again, show, because when you come into the big ones, you've already, as it were, softened uh, the students' mind up so that they're now receptive to thinking about it.
Now, uh, Murray, I wonder if if Rothbard's writing is is clear enough on the distinction between the nation state as we know it and something like a medieval personal state. Hmm. Probably not. He adopts what is essentially the Weberian uh, definition of the state, which is probably correct. Uh, you know, it's it's that organization which claims, bracket rightfully, uh, the monopoly of force within a given territory. Uh, that's why I say that the state as we know it originated in the 17th century because it's a product of the breakdown of the medieval synthesis, the product of the Reformation. It comes from that period. Okay, so when when the when the church breaks up and you've already had the empire broken up, then that's when you get uh, the nation state. But elements of the state, at least you know, in the empire, they they claim the monopoly. Of force, but they strictly speaking, they weren't able to enforce it. They hadn't got the means. The populations were too diverse. So, uh, it's and, your, and, yeah. and sorry, just to finish, even in, yeah. in, in the Middle Ages, of course, you had overlapping authorities. Uh, you had you had you had you know vertical and horizontal, and you had merchants and so on. So it was a complicated legal and political structure. And the the, the fun of that, if you like, for somebody was that there were cracks. There were crevices, there were gaps you could slip in and out of, you could move around. It wasn't ideal. I don't want to make it sound idyllic, but at least you didn't have, uh, you didn't have the what, what, what uh, I suppose in the 20th century became the totalitarian claims of the state to be all in all, to determine ultimately every feature, to be the final port of call, legal port of call. Okay, that didn't work in the Middle Ages. So that, there is a transition. Okay. That is very interesting. I didn't, I, I guess I didn't entirely understand that that was your view, that the Rothbardian view of the state really comes into being as a modern thing. Yep. Uh, and uh, the state of the 12th century, the state of the 19th century. Well, you can hardly call, in fact, uh, yeah. in uh, that book by, what's it, I can't think of his name, the, um, the legal scholar, uh, Law and Revolution, uh, Harold Berman. Berman argues, in fact, that the state, the first state was the church. It's an interesting thesis. He says they were the first ones to develop a central organized authority, a bureaucracy. Yes. You need a bureaucracy in order to organize a state. That's why a personal rule. That's why, in other words, in the move, for example, in Rome from the Republic to the Empire, really only begins to take shape about 200 AD when the emperors begin to develop a bureaucracy. Right, and that's when they be, that's when you begin to exercise something. The permanent like aspect of the permanent state. Permanent aspect of the state and the, and the control. And of course, Frederick, uh, Frederick the Great. Uh, again, so the, so the, this period of time, the 11th, 12th century, is really the beginnings of Western civilization as we know it. It's from that that we get the universities. It's from that that we get the the, mod the beginnings of the modern state. Frederick attempted to, but wasn't in a position to control the empire in the way that he wanted. But he did. He did. To, he set up the University of Naples as a training institution for his civil servants. He he wanted these people, and of course, the University of Bologna was started by and run by students again for with an idea that they would go into the public service. I mean, they, they were guys on the make, just like they are now lawyers, well, lawyers then lawyers now. We yeah. know what they're like. So you have the beginnings of that, but the 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 nature of, of society at that period uh, was such that it it simply wasn't possible, even for somebody as strong will say as the emperors, to impose their rule in the way that they wanted to. It took it took the breakup of the religious. Uh, unity of Europe before that became available. I, I have to um, uh, ask you a last question. I think I could sit here um, all afternoon with you. Thank this you. is so fascinating. But uh, just just one last question on this issue of the state. T uh, I think my my impression is that today, when when people think of the state, they think of politicians. Yes. Uh, who are we going to elect? Who are the, who's the face? You know yeah. the the guy. And you're saying that's just completely wrong. Yeah, the, the state you see is an institution, and and like, uh, institutions always have to be served by particular individuals. In other words, you can't have an institution that doesn't have people, if you like, pulling the levers. But the whole point about the, about an institution is that any individual can come or go. No individual is indispensable. So, it, it, in other words, so say in in Britain you've got a prime minister, you're always going to have a prime minister. It'll be this guy, it'll be that guy, but it doesn't really make too much difference, as we see. So the inst well, once you have set up the state, you've set up what is, if you like, a, a complicated apparatus of levers and so on, and that, and then you can more or less slot anybody in to to pulling those particular levers. The politics game as we played, 
here in the United States and in the UK and in Ireland, simply involves shuffling the lever pullers around. <laughs> you can have this group of lever pullers or that group of lever or pullers. Even more profoundly, you could even uh, uh, put all of the pol political figures on a, on a, on a boat to, to China and, and the state would still. Well, we, we, have a, we have a spectacular case. Belgium. Belgium at the moment hasn't had a government for almost a year. The part They had an election about a year ago, as we speak, and they have not been able to form a government. And by and large, the Belgian bureaucracy and, and so on has been continuing to do the kinds of things. Now, some decisions are going to come up that are going to cause problems because they will need executive that, action. There's hard for, for change. There's no way to change but, the system. But, but isn't it astonishing, yeah. astonishing that the government can disappear for nine, ten months and... Nobody seems to notice that. But it's, it's, but it's not anarchy. It's it's a state. It's continues. exactly the same thing. The bureaucratic structures are all yeah. in place, and they all get administered, and everything gets turned over in more or less the same way. Which goes to show that it isn't really the people. It's the, it's the actual creation of the institution, and that is another major difference between the modern state and the medieval states. Uh, Professor Casey, we have so much to learn from you. <laughs> I'm glad that you uh, you used this interview to teach us a little bit. I hope we're going to hear much more from you in the future. Thank you for all your wonderful work and for coming to Auburn and Not for sitting down here with it's you. It's my pleasure. Thank you.